So that's not here yet because the, the tuna haven't migrated across the Pacific. But I'm thinking that by about 2013, um, we might see contamination of the, of the water and of the top of the food chain fishes um, as they, um, uh, on the West Coast. Well, but I keep hearing the, the Pacific is a really big ocean. Um, yeah, that's, that, that old saw has been trouted out a lot. Uh, and I think what they're missing here in, in those stories, of course, is what you've mentioned, which is the bioaccumulation, which is that these are, these are many of these isotopes mimic uh, really important elements, and so our bodies preferentially take them up, but so do microorganisms, and then they all get eaten by something larger than them, and so on as we go. And, and over the course of that, uh, we should all be familiar with this, because this is how mercury tends to bioaccumulate. Um, this is how a lot of toxins bioaccumulate. So we're really talking about the concentration of radioactive particles. And, and you mentioned that you you have some assessment that um, more radioactivity has landed in the Pacific Ocean than um, than did in the Black Sea from Chernobyl. Do you, do you have a sense of how much you think has gone in? Uh, well, actually, it's Woods Hole, and they're certainly a reputable scientific organization. Uh, they're saying 10 times more. And yes, the Pacific's big, um, but uh, we're still talking about what's there now. And, and I think it's important for, for everyone to understand that we're not out of the woods. You know, when Chernobyl was over, we were still 10 times what Chernobyl was over, and we're still um, have no end in sight for releases from Fukushima, and it's already 10 times that. Um, I, I am concerned. We're, we've already seen um, small fish on the order of uh, four or five inch fish as far away as 50 miles containing cesium levels of, of 10 to 50 times higher than allowable. And, of course, those fish are going to get eaten by bigger fish up the, up the food chain. So it's a concern. Seaweed seems to absorb um, iodine, but it also absorbs cesium, which is something that I just learned. Um, I was worried. I was telling people, don't worry about seaweed um, after 90 days because the iodine's all gone. But I'm not sure about that um, at this point um, because, uh, as I understand it now, it can also absorb the cesium. So I'm... Um, a little unsure on that science. Well, uh, fortunately, the EPA has a rigorous testing program in place, right? <laughs> right. Trust me, I'm from the government. <laughs> right. I, yeah, unfortunately on that. So so this is part of the environmental legacy of, of Fukushima. And, oh, by the way, I should mention in, in, in my research I came across um, uh, the idea that uh, shellfish, and particularly crabs and cr other crustaceans, will accumulate cesium um, pretty heavily in, in their shells. So, so we might want to add shellfish to to uh, to the cesium story there as well. I, I think if I lived there personally, I would just be avoiding all seafood um, from the Pacific, as you mentioned. I think that's that's sage advice at this point, uh, until and unless we had a really um, believable and aggressive monitoring program. Uh, I would be personally leery myself. But well, the, can you talk to us? What what really then are the the health risks that you think are are faced by those who live in in or near the 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 reactor um, at this point on the reactor complex? Well, there's a large plume of radioactivity that moved to the north and to the west um, out as far as 50 miles. That, uh, I don't know how you're going to clean it up economically. You know, there, um, it's, it, there's cesium deposition higher than the, the forbidden zones of, of uh, Chernobyl um, out 50 miles, just, just in that northwesterly direction. So again, thank God the wind was blowing mainly out to sea. Um, I think it's... Um, it's going to boil down to does Japan want to spend the money, um, but I, I can't imagine people ever getting back into the 20 kilometer zone, um, especially in that northeastern, northwestern quadrant. Rather, it just is going to cost way too much to uh, uh, to decontaminate um, that land. Um, farming is going to be a problem out as well because again, the, you know, cows and cattle will uh, will absorb cesium for years to come. You know, we're seeing that in Germany after Chernobyl. We're still seeing, and 30 years ago, wild boars in Germany that eat mushrooms are still contaminated with cesium. So this is not a problem that goes away in a, a generation. You know, it, it, it hangs around for quite a while. I think the, there's two cost issues here. I think the cost, um, and it really does boil down to money at, at some point, um, the cost to decontaminate the site is probably going to be on the order of 30 to 50 billion dollars. Normally, uh, a decommissioning is around a billion to, to decommission a plant that's relatively clean. But each of these plants has got a molten blob of fuel at the bottom, which is a territory that no one's ever 
uh, assessed. And that's just the site. So I'm thinking that um, a 30 to $50 billion hit for the nation of Japan, because I don't think TEPCO can afford it, uh, as well as contamination further inland, uh, could easily be a, a hundred billion more. Now, uh, I put that out on my website, and uh, I had people say, "Oh no, it's never going to be that high." But uh, of course, it'll be a long time before we get there. And some of those costs get, might get mixed up with tsunami costs as well. But it wouldn't surprise me in excess of a hundred billion dollars uh, to decontaminate that area within. 20 or 30 kilometers of Fukushima would be a, a realistic number. And when we say decontaminate, I mean, so I guess you scrub surfaces, but once you've got the stuff down to the soil level, don't you do what they did in Chernobyl? I mean, what, what can you do besides carve the top number of inches off and uh, cart it away and pile it up somewhere? Is there is there more that can be done? Um, no. No, there's not. Um, basically, it becomes a disposal somewhere, so it's going to go to somebody's backyard. And um, cesium is... Um, is quite water soluble, so it does move down through the soil over time. There is again some work with zeolite that um, uh, seems to indicate that you can lay down some zeolite and it will pull the cesium back out. But you're talking about hundreds of square miles here, um, so this is uh, a little more than a science project. Well, I'm you know I'm I'm really uh, still a little bit shocked that you were able to receive air filters through the mail. I presume in some way um, that that came in with. Uh, uh, some contamination on them, and and uh, this is something I've been focused on for a while is is trying to assess what the real economic impacts are going to be uh, outside of the borders of Japan. You know, a very important manufacturing industrial center, um, critical in, in certain supply chains. Uh, you know, maybe we'll find ways to mitigate that over time, but for now, they have a bunch of critical functions and just worrying about what might happen to their import export balance um, if if it turns out that. Uh, there's more evidence of, of these sort of, you know, strange contamination moments popping up. Hey, it's in the sludge. Oops, it's in air filters. Wait a minute. It's on, you know, they don't really, it's, it's, it could end up anywhere. Um, what, do you have any insight into what sort of supply chain disruptions you might expect at this point or, or how they might manage this process of importing, exporting, given everything needs to be checked for contamination and how you would go about that? What, what's, what are we facing here? Um, well, I was a little bit surprised that Hillary Clinton um, you know, made her, uh, of some sort of a pact with the Japanese to try to encourage um, uh, buying Japanese uh, food and vegetables. Um, clearly, the, the food and vegetable chain. I think we already we already talked about. I I think the uh, the large industrial products like uh, automobiles and um, you know their transistors and computers and things like that are are probably um, going to be just fine. The boxes they're made in, I might be a little bit concerned about, uh, and uh, you know that they're shipped in. Um, but I would expect that the shippers would be on top of that because the last thing you know, Sony wants is a, is a crate load of televisions coming up contaminated because the boxes are contaminated. So I think the big guys are, are going to be alert to that, you know, the Mitsubishis and the Sonys and the Hitachis, um, and are going um, to watch that a lot. Um, it's the intermediate people in the market, the, 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 the small manufacturers, um, who um, you know, there's some clay pots coming out of Japan and things like that, um, and and I'm hoping that there'll be some kind of you know, government monitoring on that because uh, without that, I don't have any confidence uh, of what kind of product I'm I'm buying. Right. So, um, all right. So to wrap this up, I, I I'm just interested in um, uh, for all of our listeners who who may live in Japan or live on the west coast or wherever they happen to be, if there's an aftershock and if Building Four sort of topples over. What would your advice be? Um, I heard your advice to the people in Japan. Um, get on a plane if possible or get far away or know which way the wind is moving and go, go uh, the other direction. Um, uh, what would you do if you were uh, in the United States if, and, that, and you saw that, that that had happened? Well, I'm in touch with some scientists now who have been monitoring the uh, air on the West Coast. And in um, Seattle, for instance, in April, the average person in Seattle breathed in 10 hot particles a day. What? I yeah. did not know that. <laughs> well, the, the report, you know, it's just science, so it takes some time to, uh, uh, you know, to make its way into the literature. But um, if uh, the average human being breathes about 10 meters a day of, uh, of air, cubic meters a day of air, and uh, air samplers out in the Seattle area are detecting when they pull 
10 cubic meters through them. This is in April now, so we're at the end of May, so it's, it, it's, it's a better situation now. But um, that air filter will have 10 hot particles on it. Now, um, and that was before the unit, uh, the unit 4 um, issue. Um, clearly, you know, we all can't run south of the equator to our second homes in Rio or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. But it will stay north of the uh, north of the equator for anyone who has a Learjet to get out. But the the I, I guess what I'm advising at that point is uh, uh, keep your windows closed. Um, I I would definitely wear a, uh, you know some sort of a filter when I was outside. I w certainly wouldn't run um, and exercise until I was sure the plume had had uh, had dissipated. This isn't now. This this is as you, as you were saying. This is this is worst case. Um, but um, uh, if Unit 4 were to topple, I would, you know, close my windows, uh, turn the air conditioner on, replace the filters frequently, uh, damp mop, um, put, um, put a HEPA filter in the house, and, and uh, try to avoid as much of the hot particles as possible. You're not going to walk out with a Geiger counter and be in a plume that's going to drive, the, that's going to peg the meter. The issue will be on the West Coast hot particles and... Uh, um, the solution there is HEPA filters and, and avoiding them. There's also uh, potentially some uh, um, some medical issues. Um, Maggie and I and Fairwinds have been working with a couple of doctors to uh, uh, to look at uh, ways to mitigate to help your body cleanse particles if you know you've been exposed to them. But that's a little bit premature to go into much more detail on that. Right. So, so, uh, but this is all worst case, and uh, we're just going to keep our eyes on it. I think the important message here is that uh, the situation is not yet over. Uh, it's something we're going to have to keep our eyes on, which is tricky because the media tends to not have a, a very long um, attention span when it comes to these things. But in your estimation, it, it's still an evolving situation over there. There could still be some curveballs. It's possible that you know there might be a steam explosion at three. There might be a, a toppling event at building four. These are some of the key risks we're going to keep our eyes on the lookout for. Is, is there anything else to this story you want to add? No, it's going to be a long slog. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Arnie. Uh, it's just been a, a fabulous conversation. And uh, again, where should people go if they want to follow you and find out more? Well, uh, Martinson has an O in it, but Gunderson has an E in it. So, uh, and and so does Fairwinds. F A I R E W I N D S uh, dot com is our uh, is our blog and uh, it's our website rather and uh, maggie and i are doing it for free we're not um, it, it's been uh, uh, volunteer work we do have a donate button to keep our computer whiz computing uh, but it's not for profit venture on our